Good morning and hello, Chart Watchers. Welcome to this Monday, June 24th, 2019 Market Watchers Live show with your host, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Let's take a look at what's going on to start off the week here. It's uh, kind of a flat day. We've seen a little bit of strength. We've got the Dow Jones Industrial Average currently up 55 points, uh, the S&P 500 up two. The NASDAQ up three and the Russell 2000 down seven. So seeing a little underperformance once again in the small cap stocks. Notice the other major indices kind of holding those gains that we've seen in June and the Russell 2000 starting to roll over. Ten-year Treasury yield down again today, down almost five basis points, 2.02%. Volatility index uh, flat. So uh, even though we're seeing a little bit of weakness in small caps and the other indices just kind of flat, Volatility not really doing a whole lot today. Consumer staples leading to the upside, along with materials and technology. Energy, which had a very strong week last week on the heels of higher crude oil prices, backing off today, trying to move back below that 50-day moving average, something to watch for later today. Toys having a really big day today, and this is a big level. I'm going to talk about this index in just a little bit, but this would be a big breakout if we can see uh, continuing strength later today and into the rest of the week. The uh, gold mining stocks, you can see having a very, very nice month in June, really started back in May, continuing to have another uh, nice day today. United Technologies leading the Dow to the upside while Home Depot weighs on the Dow Jones. And then finally, Bristol Myers. We've talked about this stock not really being a very good relative performer in the pharma space. Today, it is the worst performer in the S&P 500, dropping nearly 7%. All right, Aaron, it's the start of another week. Uh, market's been a little mixed, kind of, I don't know, consolidating after the uh, gains that we've seen so far in June and the all-time highs last week. But uh, how was your weekend and how are you doing? Oh, well, my weekend was very enjoyable. Uh, nice to take some time off. Uh, saw some old friends, so that was fun. Uh, the market uh, seems a little tentative after the Fed announcement last week and trade negotiation. It seems like the market's just sort of sitting back and watching for a little bit. Yeah, and I think some of it makes a little bit of sense. I mean, you know, we had the S&P 500 make that big move last week and really throughout June so far. And uh, we did go back and we tested those highs that we saw to open May. I don't know if you recall, but that first day in May, we printed a bearish engulfing candle and kind of marked that top right near 29.50 went down the entire month of May. And then uh, in June, we've now made up all that ground and we've come up uh, probably about 200 points since the end of May and uh, right back to that 2950 level. So I guess it kind of makes sense that we'd see a little selling here because that's where the selling started back in early May. But it's still, I guess, you know, like you said, the Fed came out, kind of did their thing, turned a little bit more dovish, which the market was expecting. And now after uh, anticipating that and rising, it seems like the S&P 500 just kind of waiting now for another catalyst. And I don't know what that catalyst is going to be. We do have earnings in a few weeks. Maybe it's U.S.-China trade. Maybe there will be a deal later this week. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Got to digest that move from last week, too. So, Yeah. And, you know, I, I did mention when I was doing the update that the small caps are having a little issue uh, so far uh, today. And that I'm going to show you is having an impact on one industry in particular, where the industry group as a whole doesn't look that bad. But when you start breaking it down between large, mid and small cap stocks, you see a distinct difference with how that group's been trading. But uh, you have to stick around for that one. I'll get into that just a little bit. But uh, what do we got going uh, for today? All right. Well, first, let's see what's going on this week. Pop culture stocks. Mary Ellen will be in for a round table tomorrow. Brian Shannon will be here on Wednesday and Bruce Frazier, Mr. Wyckoff will join us on Thursday. And then on July 2nd, next week, we have July seasonality. We are do to do going to premiere our chart, chart wise women show. Uh, Mary Ellen and I will be doing that. Hope you guys tune in for that. J July 4th, there is no market watchers and Tony Dwyer will join us uh, the week after the 4th. That's all I got. Today's agenda, Monday setups. We're going to, it's a typical Monday. Uh, earnings spotlight, uh, 10 and 10 is going to be Amgen, if you want to go look at that. And then I will finish up the show with the sentiment update. So 
Stick around, we've got lots to do. So let's start with our technical news and headlines. Yeah, there really actually was little uh, news out today. So no real big economic news, no earnings reports. This is kind of a quiet period before earnings season really kicks in uh, in another few weeks. But uh, the 10-year Treasury yield may, may be quiet in terms of economic news, but this 10-year Treasury yield down another four and a half basis points today, back to 2.02%. We were looking at this 204 yield support from back in September. We went below it late last week, took a bounce on Friday, and now we're back down below it again. Another break below 2%, I don't think would be a very good thing unless you're holding um, treasuries on the long side. If you're doing that, things, uh, you, know, you want to see this yield continue dropping because that means the treasury prices are rising. Um, but from an equity perspective, you'd rather see money rotate out of treasuries, sending the treasury yields higher. And we're not seeing that right now. It doesn't mean the S&P can't go higher, but historically the S&P 500 tends to do a lot better when money is rotating away from treasuries because you're not just getting new money into the equity markets, but you're also getting rotating money from other asset classes. So that's one of the reasons why I don't like to see this moving down. But the way I look at it is there's really not there hasn't been a lot of places to put your money in 2019 and the 10 year Treasury yield uh, provides some safety and U.S. stock market, the, the, the S&P 500, the benchmark has been doing better than most areas around the world. So we're getting money going into both uh, the, the Treasury market and the equity market. I don't think that lasts long term. So uh, I think it would be best for the equity market for that 10 year Treasury yield to start to turn higher. All right. I wanted to mention a couple things with regard to historical performance on the S&P 500 before I pull up charts. Any other charts? Uh, Monday's worst day of the week since 1950 on the S&P 500. Mondays have produced annualized returns of minus 14.82 percent. Um, and that compares to nine percent throughout the year on the S&P. So Mondays are about 24 percentage points below the norm. Um, that doesn't mean that Mondays go down 24%. That's, that's an annualized return. But it does show that the tendency is for Mondays to struggle a little bit. That's what we're seeing. Even though we're up a little bit today, the tendency is for Mondays to underperform. The other thing worth noting is we're at the time of the calendar month, 19th to the 25th, where we tend to see weakness on the S&P 500. The annualized return for this period is minus 8.88% since 1950. Again, that's about 18 percentage points below that norm of 9%. 9% is the average annual return on the S&P 500. So if every day and every period was created equal, we would always see that 9%. But like I said, 19th to the 25th minus 8.88%. So underperformance this time of the month to give you the numbers each day of the calendar month, the 19th, and I'm not just talking about June, by the way, January 19th, February 19th, March 19th, all of these you add up. So the 19th of all calendar months minus 34.69%. The 20th minus 7.1%. The 21st is positive 4.91%. 22nd minus 12.04%. 23rd minus 2.4%. The 24th minus 3.65%. And the 25th minus 6.84%. Every one of those days, significantly below that 9% average, with the exception maybe of the 21st, which has a 4.91% positive. Just That's about four percentage points below the norm. All the others are well below, though, double digit below the norm. So I always pay attention to the 19th to the 25th. And if you're wondering why, the market tends to go up from the 11th to the 18th. And of course, that is the period that we head into options expiration. So a lot of times if folks are getting in, and most options that are traded um, are on the um, uh, long side, calls, then it makes sense that for market makers who are on the opposite side of these trades, it's you know it behooves them for the market to move lower. So I think they use their capital sometimes to help direct prices. Just my own personal opinion, never worked there. Not, uh, not saying there's collusion, I'm just saying that that has been the history and that's what kind of makes sense to me. All right, let's get into, um, I wanted to show you the software. I mentioned earlier that the performance today, when you look at this, you see the Dow up 42, the S&P up one, but the Russell is down more than a half percent. And where I could really see this was when I looked at one of the industry groups in technology, and that is the software space. You look at software and you say, wow, this is the leading group in technology. 
Well, it is, but if we rank it by scooter and then we break it down by large cap, mid cap, and small cap, look at the large cap stocks. So these are the ones that have the highest scooter ratings or uh, rankings among large cap. And so we can look at it, and most of these stocks are higher. Workday is one exception here. Um, I know Microsoft here was up. Microsoft up almost 1%. That's going to have a big influence. Adobe, of course, they reported last week up 1% today, breaking out. So you look at the software group and you say, oh, great. It's having a good day. Well, let's move down to the mid caps, where when you start looking at the highest um, scooter scores on the mid caps, you see Shopify up here, minus 3.8%. Viva down 2%. Most of these um, high scooter ranking mid cap software stocks are lower today. And when we go down and take a look at the small, almost every one of them are down. So even within a group like software, the distinction between being large cap, mid cap, and small cap having a real big uh, difference today in terms of performance. So if you're looking at that, that software index and you say, wow, my software stocks are down, but software is up today, probably you're looking at stocks that you own that are either mid cap or small cap. And I say this, and I looked into it because I do own some of these that are not performing particularly well today. All right, I wanted to mention one last area of the market, and that is the toy group. And I bring this up because I know last time we had Bruce Fraser on, I wanted him to look at this chart because it just seemed like um, the group was consolidating and maybe making a turn, getting ready to make a turn to the upside. So you see this downtrend? Throughout 2019, we just keep consolidating and we, we keep failing at about 840 to 850. Well, we are at 842 and change right now. Close over 850 would be the first such close since mid-November. So this is kind of a big deal. I would watch the toys group closely. And if you like it, go into the toys industry group, sort the industry group by scooter rank, maybe take a look at some of those larger uh, cap uh, or large, um, better scooter scores um, amongst the toys group. That would be one way maybe to take a look at it. But this is a group that has been languishing for a while and could just beginning to start um, a maybe a move, an absolute, maybe even a relative move back to the upside worth mentioning. All right. Uh, now we're going to go into our scooter mover of the day. And I went with the top scooter um, mover here in the large cap area, which is electronic arts. You can see here it's moved up almost 17 points to 57 and a half. And I'm going to bring the chart up and just show you maybe a little longer term here. Let's go back a couple years. We are starting to see some movement and perhaps a two month breakout. Uh, if we can get through 100, we would certainly do that. I think also, if you take a look, we got this downtrend line that might be, we may be seeing a breakout today of that. Also, check out the PPO, which is just turning up above that center line. So when I look at these scooter movers, it's not just about whether they're moving up or down, but then I like to bring the chart up to see whether or not we're actually getting something co that's confirming on a technical basis. And I think this is a stock worth watching because after moving down, we moved up for a period of a couple months, sideways consolidating here between 90 and 100. I think a breakout above 100 would be uh, pretty bullish here for electronic arts. So... That is your scooter mover of the day. All righty, let's go ahead and get started with some upgrades and downgrades. And we're going to start off with 3D Systems. 3D Systems was upgraded today by B. Riley from a sell to a neutral. And their price target at this point, let's go ahead and get a horizontal line. Uh, their price target is $8, so we could actually take this up just a little bit, and we're going to use that tool here. What I like, you know, honestly, one of the things I like is you can see um, how low or high we're at. So that's 781, so we, it would be even a little bit higher, but I'm going to just mark that there at 781 because that makes the most sense to me. Uh, that's where your support level is. And in the shorter term, you can see that there is overhead resistance that was at this May top, but we did actually get back above that. Of course, we're trading below it now, but uh, interesting uh, setup here for an upgrade. They did move it, like I said, to a neutral. So 
uh, you know, having a target down here below what they're, it's trading at, that's really a, 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 a in, indicative of the fact that uh, they're looking at more sideways action and maybe a test of the area of support down there. So something to consider. The PMO doesn't look too bad. You know, it's starting to curl over. But, you know, on the breakout, I mean, it could be interesting if we could get above that 50-day EMA, but it really does look like it's getting ready to stop there. So the neutral kind of makes sense to me. Beer and Company was upgraded by Jefferies today from a hold to a buy. They have moved their price target from 150 of course, right there, to up, up to, let's see, 190. So we're looking at, let's move this down even further. There is what we're looking at as far as the, right there. That's the new target as far as B. Riley or Jeffries is concerned. I, you know, I, I, I suppose you could say uh, something good and the a possibility of a move to that direction. You know, we've got a PMO that's now moved into uh, positive territory. This has been an amazing rally for John Deere. I sure wish I had been in on this one, as a lot of us do. And I know a lot of you trade it. So um, good job there if you're holding on to that. I would continue to hold it because the PMO still looks healthy and it is not overbought yet. And look at OBD volume. It's really continuing to confirm this move to the upside. We have a 50, 200 day uh, crossover that gives us a uh, a long-term trend model buy signal. And of course the 20 just got itself above the 50. And so that is a intermediate term buy signal on John Deere. So we moved, uh, you know, we had a really deep decline there in May, but it has certainly uh, managed to get itself back up. The next area to watch, of course, is that 170 area. Next one up is Fortinet. Fortinet was upgraded today by JP Morgan from a neutral to overweight, so they're expecting some good things. However, I was I thought it was kind of interesting that they set their price target at $93. So let's move that up here toward 93. There's 94. $93. So they're looking really at this area of overhead resistance that we saw back here at that September high. Uh, you know, we managed to get back above that and set a new high back in April, but it certainly fell off after that point. Looks like a possible flag that is forming right here. And we got the breakout, which would be considered an execution of that flag. PMO's on a buy signal and uh, moving ever closer toward the zero line. It's still a bit on the oversold side, but it's doing what you wanna see it do. And that is moving upward. Uh, the OBV has me a little concerned, but really when you consider the decline we had here and sort of the up down, uh, indecision on this breakout. Uh, that makes sense. And again, I like to see that pullback after the breakout and in the short term, I'd be looking at this gap right here to be filled. Uh, I think that's very possible. You just need to get uh, above this area right here of overhead resistance at 79.50, 79.40. All right, let's look at a couple of downgrades real quick. We have international paper. It was downgraded by Stevens from overweight to equal weight. So they've moved it into a neutral position. This one didn't have any targets on it. Let's just look right here at, uh, there's at the trading range that we saw in 2019, really all the way up until mid-May, uh, we were moving in that range. We've since broken down below that for a second time, which I don't particularly like. So it makes sense. Again, they're moving into that neutral position. But honestly, I mean, I would be looking for support way down here. You've got short-term opportunity for support back here at, you know, uh, around $40, 86, 85 cents. Uh, that's the next area. Um, and it is, they moved it to an equal weight. So it certainly could hold that support, but right now I'd be looking for downside movement for international paper. Spotify was downgraded from inline to an underperform. Uh, we will likely be talking a lot about Spotify tomorrow during our uh, pop culture roundtable. But as you can see, made a move up to test that top we saw back in February and has turned down in a big way. Uh, you know, 
big trading range today, and it is up over one and three quarters percent. So maybe that 20 day EMA is going to be the the area for support and we won't have to watch it go all the way down to what I would look at as a possible area of support at these lows that we saw back here in March and May. That's where I'd be looking as far as a test of support. But, you know, I think, I, I mean, I like the way this is actually performing right now. And the PMO, while it is getting a little bit overbought, there's still certainly room to move it higher. And then our last one is WEC, B of A, Merrill, downgraded it from a neutral to an un underperform. They moved their price target from $85, which is pretty much right up where it's at right now, a little bit lower than that. Um, and then they moved it to... Uh, they moved it from 82 to 85. And remember, th this is interesting because it went into an underperform uh, position and they st they actually raised their target from 82 to uh, 85. But you know what? We're sitting at 85 right now. Um, they're expecting it to move lower, I suspect, but an interesting call on the um, price target there. PMO is still rising, but it is overbought. Uh, you know, we've been in a pretty nice run, but that looks like a possible um, rising wedge. And of course, that's a bearish pattern. All right, that's it for upgrades and downgrades. Here's what I went over. I will have that up this evening in the Market Watchers Live recap. All right, we will be right back with our Monday setups. Welcome back. It is time for our Monday setups, Tom. And well, you know, I thought we did okay. You were really doing well until today on yours. So let's go ahead and we'll look really quickly at those charts. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, well, mine wasn't that great. I mean, I let's see, I got it in, I got in at 68.46. Uh, I guess we're up just a little bit here. So that's, you know, not too bad on that call. But you know, look at the PMO going on here. It's topped and it's now putting in a sell signal. So if you did follow on uh, with purchasing that Monday setup, watch that $68 level. That's going to be interesting as support. And the PMO is telling us to expect a short term move down to at least test that. So yours was GLDD and we got in at $10.49. So you're up slightly. Yeah, I mean, I, could we just go with like a um, Friday? A typo? Can we go with a typo and just say I picked G O L D instead of G? -O -L -D? Yeah, right. <laughs> of course, everybody knows what that's been. Doing. <laughs> yeah, that's actually, the typo. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a huge mover. Yeah, that's what I meant to do. I just typed it in wrong. Yeah, G that's it. <laughs> now G L D D actually on the chart, I liked it, and I still like it, even with the pullback today. The pullback's on much lighter volume. Um, and it got right up to resistance. It's in a nice little, maybe an ascending triangle, maybe a little sideways flag, you know, off of the uptrend from earlier in the year. Volume trends are strong. The stock was up about 6% from last Monday through intraday on, on Friday and yeah. then uh, pulled back a couple percent on Friday and then down three and a half percent today. So it kind of gave it all back. Uh, but I still like the stock. I think this one is one that uh, will do well going forward. Sure. I can see that. All right. Well, we're only as good as our, our current picks, so let's make it better this time. <laughs> yeah. Although, like I said, it wasn't bad. We were both up on the week, so I can't, I can't say that it's, a, it's not a good call. Yeah, and I actually, I went through all of our picks last week, and a number of our picks actually did really well until about Thursday. Yes. And even though the, the market held up all, all right on Friday, I think some stocks that have been, some of the bigger, um, the higher scooter ranked stocks, actually pulled back at the end of last week and they're doing the same today 
Whereas some of the stocks that have not been performing well, many of the energy stocks, material stocks, and so forth are ones that are kind of picking up the slack and moving higher. So it's good to see that, but there is a little bit of short-term rotation, I think may have impacted some of our picks. But what do you have for this week? All right, well, kind of a smattering of everything. Uh, I even ended up putting an ETF in there for our ETF uh, follow on from our Thursday discussion, I guess, on uh, possible ETF involvement. And I saw actually the Schwab, there were a couple of the equity ETFs that came up. This one was the one that I liked the best of the ETFs. That's not what my pick will be. Uh, but let's go ahead and we're going to start with GGG. And go go take the poll, guys. I'm curious what you think of our picks, and you know if you're interested in in them, just to see you know how we stack up here. But I thought GGG looked great, and honestly, I'm going to just be upfront here. This was my pick for the week. Let's go ahead. I want to annotate it just a wee bit, and then we'll just go over the others real quickly. All right. So short term, of course, today we're getting the breakout. There was a little test and a pop just above on Friday and it fell back down. Uh, now it's breaking out. It looks like it might close above it, but of course it's still very early. I'm looking at overhead resistance all the way up here, $54. Of course, we could run into a little bit of issue uh, right here with the shorter term resistance level at about 52.50. But for the week, um, I'm looking at this one to continue higher. Uh, look at that beautiful PMO, of course, now in positive territory. And uh, Scooter has been rising since uh, June, looks like June 17th, right around there. So I think that looks pretty good. Uh, OBV, you know, technically we got a top, a lower top this time and a higher top that time. Uh, but I think it's pretty even. I'm not really, it, it doesn't concern me. Let's put it that way. So GGG is my pick and it is at 51.28. So we'll see what happens uh, from there. But here were some, I thought there were a lot of uh, pretty decent picks. I didn't get them from my general PMO scan. Uh, a lot of these are on momentum moves already, but what I saw that I liked are a lot of these PMOs, although they had the buy signal a while back, they're now moving into positive territory. And that tells you that there's uh, even more internal strength. You know, you like to get those oversold buy signals, but when you move into t uh, positive territory, that's sort of your first attention flag that uh, the internal strength is, is building. And look at this pretty 20, 50 day EMA <clears throat> excuse me, positive crossover. Uh, so I could see this one continuing higher. It's pulling back um, at this point just a wee bit there. Um, I mean, and it could go back to that 20. So that was one of the reasons I didn't pick it, but I think this one looks like it could continue higher. J2, Global Communications. Thought this one looked good on this breakout above that short-term resistance level. Um, but, you know, overhead resistance is just above 90. Um, I, I think it has the same sort of setup as the other two. I think it still looks really powerful, uh, could be good, but I don't like being that close to overhead resistance. Um, it's fine on an intermediate term play, but I think on the, in the shorter term, I would want, I wouldn't want my overhead resistance sitting that close. Um, but we do have the buy signal and it's rising and merit medical there we go, flag formation. PMO is starting to turn over a little bit, but that's what you should expect on the pullback. And notice it's pulling back right to support at that top from May. Thought that looked pretty good. Here's that ETF. And you've got the short-term break at above $53. Uh, we are looking at some very short-term overhead resistance at about $54.25-ish. But I'd be looking for that move above $54.50. I don't see any reason why it can't. Uh, the buy signal looks good. We're now in positive territory, 2050 positive crossover. Southern Company, um, I've been in this one for a while. I think I got it. I think it was a Monday setup or an upgrade. I can't remember back in May uh, when I got in. And I'm, of course, very happy with it. And I would look for it to continue higher. PMO getting ready to make a new high uh, to confirm this move to the upside. Uh, it's holding well above the 20 day EMA. Uh, everything looks pretty healthy here. So I thought Sund Southern looked good. And Sarah, 
Sarepta Sir, Therapeutics, which I put in the poll as my other pick. Uh, love this. It made that move up. It's pulled back right to 125, uh, just a bit above, which is a good support level. PMO is starting to top out just a little, but you know what? When you get a pullback to the 20 like this, totally expected. So that would be my other pick for Monday setups. All right. I am going to go right off the bat with CDNS, which is Cadence Design Systems. I wrote about this one in my blog this morning. Current price is 7160 so we'll go with it there. I just like, first of all, it's in software, which obviously we know software has been strong. It's been a leader in software for quite a while now. It's got great volume trends. We did have that pullback in May when the market got hit a little bit, but it was one of the first to, to kind of come roaring back here in June. Broke out to another high, it's pulled back here just in the last couple of days. I think short term, we might see $70. That would be the breakout area and, uh, and possibly even a 20 day test which is down at 68.34, but I would use pullback um, as a reason to enter, to accumulate. I think the stock goes higher, so that will be my pick for this week. Some of the others, and the other one that I put in the poll for today, uh, career education. This is the first 50-day test this stock has gotten since back in late January. It has been a tremendous performer to the upside, very heavy volume. It, for the most part, has been above its 20-day Finally got a 50-day test, but even all of the selling really over the past two or three weeks, you can see has been on much lighter volume. So I think this is a stock that was uh, up almost to 2050 two weeks ago, and now we're down at 1876. I think that is providing a really uh, uh, nice entry, reward to risk entry into the stock. I think also after this move up and pull back to gap support around 18, that would kind of be my line in the sand. Now, if I was using that as my stop, then I'd probably consider getting into half the current price. Maybe as it gets closer to 18, you get the other half. Close below 18, I would be out. And uh, the chances are, though, that you may not get it the other half of the position. If it bounces off the 50-day, you only get half the position, but you're not taking as much risk. So it just depends on how much risk you want to take. But I do like this stock coming back down, back down to test that 50-day moving average. A few others I thought were of interest, GWPH, after gapping up in early May, you can see this huge move, heavy volume, the pullback. We have been holding this 170 level, and literally we're trading on it right now. So I think this is one you could keep a fairly tight stop short term. If it does break below 170, I think that could open the door to this gap support that was tested in April down closer to about 153, 154. So I would not be holding if it loses this 170 area. I'd wait to see if I could get it cheaper at that point. Next up, um, HCC. This is a coal stock, and I haven't really talked too much about coal, but after the big move up here early May, very heavy volume. You can see we established a low along with this gap support down close to 25. End of May, we got down into the 25s as well. So I think 25 to 26 is a pretty good price and gap support on the stock, and with it down 3.6% today, getting close to 25s, uh, that, you know, considering we were up at 29 at the high in May, I think the reward to risk improves as we get down further. Uh, RNG, this is, uh, uh, I think, computer business service uh, area, Ring Central. I like the hammer coming in today at this prior low. Uh, the stock, again, over 125, maybe 127 or so just a couple weeks ago. Today, it went down as low as 112, bouncing back, trying to hold on here. I think if it were to close below 110, I'd be out of the stock. The breakout level was about 111, 112. Uh, recent low came down here to about 113. So I think that's an area I'd watch to the downside. But this hammer could print a bottom right near that recent support. Survey Monkey SVMK, holding on to support, really good support. We broke out here at $16. Notice these pullbacks have held $16. And I do want to point out that this stock, relative to the software group, keeps going lower. So I wouldn't make any exceptions, uh, no excuses. If it closes below 16, I'd get out. But I do think this is an area where we could begin to see some outperformance from SurveyMonkey. Last one I have is OMCL, Omnicell. Big breakout, beautiful volume here. It's in the medical equipment space, which also broke out. I think you've got a really nice looking stock here. And I think the light volume pullback today is creating an opportunity. I think it could maybe pull back a little bit further, uh, 85 to 87 is an area that I think would be great for accumulation. I like OMCL. 
And those are our Monday setups for this week. So Aaron going with GGG. I'm going with CDNS. And we shall see who wins next week. All right. Yes. It is time now for Earning Spotlight. And I thought what I would do this week for Earning Spotlight is focus in on the healthcare group. I actually put a chart in on healthcare in my blog this morning. So I'll start with that. And um, let me make sure you've got my screen here, Aaron. You see that? I sure do. Okay. So here's the healthcare chart just going back over the last year. And you can see the huge move that we've had so far in June. Overhead resistance, we're getting close. But if we can make this breakout, I think this would really set up uh, going into the summer months where healthcare tends to outperform anyway. Um, I think if we get the absolute breakout to go with it, that would just lead uh, more and more money into this space. Um, and notice, too, that uh, you, know, you might look at this and say, well, it's run too much. I don't want to get in. Well, keep in mind how badly healthcare underperformed the S&P 500 for about five months here to open 2019. So yes, we've been showing some nice relative strength of late. And yes, we've been up in June quite a bit, but this is a group that really was not participating with the S&P throughout much of the first five months of 2019. So I think we could be playing some serious catch up here and we may see healthcare continuing to lead to the upside. So here's your relative strength. So having you know, kind of looked at that as the backdrop, I thought what I would do is focus on some of the companies within healthcare that have posted some really nice earnings over the past 90 days. So they are on my strong earnings chart list. They have pretty high, I think every one of these on this list has a scooter score over 70. So even though healthcare hasn't been a good uh, area of the market, these are all stocks within healthcare that have done well. And if healthcare takes off, makes a breakout, I think these are stocks that could become some pretty serious leaders in the market. Some already are. VCYT, this is Verisite. I will tell you, I do own this one. So full disclosure there. But a nice breakout above that 2627 top. We had multiple tops coming across here in that range. Notice now that the 20 day moving average is between 26 and 27. So the stock at the end of last week, and this is one of the things I was alluding to earlier. A lot of stocks ran did pretty well up until about Thursday of last week and then started pulling back. I think VCYT is in that camp. We're pulling back, but I think that 20-day moving average is something to watch. I believe VCYT goes higher. NTRA. This is uh, Natera, another stock that broke out recently. Bearish engulfing candle. Starting to see a little bit of selling here the past couple of days. Again, that's kind of been the theme of late. Uh, but the 20-day moving average has held every day since we had this big push back in uh, May. So I think this is a stock that has been performing extremely well uh, on a relative basis. I can pull up that relative chart. We can take a look at that. But most of these stocks that I pull up, you're going to see these charts, a lot of them going up from left to right, telling us that we have good relative strength in terms of the stock versus its peers and the stock versus the S&P 500. NEO. This is Neo Genomics, uh, another stock that's been in a clear uptrend for a while, even though the healthcare providers group has been down. So what that translates into is a stock that has been a monster relative to the healthcare providers group. So it would certainly make sense that if all of a sudden more money starts to rotate into healthcare providers, a lot of that money is going to look for the relative strength in the group, which NEO is part of. So I think this pullback from nearly $25 back to 23, testing this 20-day moving average, this has been an area, the 20-day and the 50-day moving average have both provided great support on this stock in 2019. So it would certainly make sense to me that 23 down to 22 would be a pretty good accumulation zone on NEO. Tandem, I've talked about this one quite a bit. I think it's simply consolidating, made this huge run from November through March. So while it may be on a relative basis, hasn't been doing as well as some others, I think we got to give it a little bit of room to consolidate after such a big move. I mean, we're talking about a stock going from 27 in November to 75 in March. Uh, that is almost a triple in four or five months. I think we can maybe allow the stock to consolidate a bit. A close back below about 61 would make me a little nervous that we were going to go back down and perhaps test this area in the low 50s again. 
So I might keep a stop there if you're in the stock, but if it uh, holds this short-term support area, I would not be surprised to see a run on this stock as it heads uh, into its earnings. Now, I believe the earnings came out here at the end of February, so we might be looking at a uh, August earnings report. I don't have the earnings date in front of me here, but I would not be surprised to see a pre-earnings run-up in this stock the way it's been trading. IDXX, this is a stock in the um, uh, medical supplies group. And uh, you can see a beautiful move up. Medical supplies certainly have strengthened, but look at this relative strength on IDXX. Beautiful, beautiful strength in the stock relative to the S&P, even though medical supplies is about a six, seven week relative low right now versus the S&P, this stock just keeps powering forward. So you got a great relative performer again here with IDXX. CDNA. This is Care DX in the health providers, healthcare providers group, coming back down, testing its 20-day moving average. Just recently, last week, did move up to $40, taking out that March high. But like so many other stocks, these last two or three days, having some profit taking back to the 20-day moving average. Also, there was a breakout here around $35. So I think $35, $36, pretty good support. Looking for another run back up to that $40. On a relative basis, I think you can see you got a pretty good stock uh, versus its peers in the S&P 500. Um, Danaher, DHR, another one after a huge move up February, March uh, into early April. We consolidated for a couple months and the volume picked up beginning of June as we took off again. So as the group has begun to see more money relative to the S&P, this is the medical equipment group. You can see that Dan Danaher is one of the leaders. And as a result, continuing to outperform, looks great on the chart. Love it on a 20-day test. Um, so maybe you wait, see if you get a little bit of a pullback. Probably $5 would be plenty on a pullback. Four or five bucks, I think, would uh, set this one up pretty nicely on a reward-to-risk basis. COO, Cooper Companies. This is a medical supply company. I loved the sideways consolidation. And, you know, when you start to see relative weakness, and I think um, – Trying to think which one it was that I was looking at earlier. I think it was Survey Monkey when I was going through my Monday setups. I'm going to just pull that up, just make sure. Yeah, here's your relative strength. See Survey Monkey on a relative strength basis, underperforming its software peers, now down at about a three, four month relative low, but it hasn't lost price support. Now let's fast forward back to COO because I think the setup here is very similar during the, the uh, spring months, we had the move up. And then while it consolidated, look at the relative weakness amongst its peers. But it didn't break down. And once it broke back out again, look at that relative strength take back off. So I, I think that when you get these stocks that are showing relative weakness for a period of time, you still want to go back to the price chart. And if the price breaks down, then I don't want any parts of it. I want to be out of it. But if the price holds up, you may want to keep it on a watch list because like Cooper companies, when you get that volume coming in and you get that breakout, it was one of the leaders before it began its consolidation. And it looks to me like it has begun to lead again to the upside. So COO, I like. ZTS and Zotis. Uh, this is in the pharma space. Pharma broke out. Its latest high was all the way back at the end of November of 2018. So it is not yet broken out, but this stock has gone from roughly $94 up to 113 now. So the relative strength here is quite apparent. Big move up on uh, the relative chart. Great volume, sideways consolidation here, but great volume to confirm this breakout. I think ZTS looks good. Did get a, a bearish uh, engulfing candle on Thursday of last week. We might go back down to this 110 area test recent price support, the 20-day moving average. To me, that would be a buy. STE, this is Steris. Um, another one, great move up. You can see that the metal equipment group is broken out. You got a leader. Uh, another stock that on a pullback to the 20-day, I think would look very good. Uh, ConMed, CNMD. Um, this is one off of a move up flag, or maybe it's almost like an ascending triangle coming across here. Finally made that breakout. We saw the volume come in on Friday um, while it was in breakout mode. The group medical supplies doing pretty well. 
the stock relative to medical supplies now at a two-month high, um, making a charge back at the relative high set back in March. And medical supplies, so assuming it holds its relative support here and begins to bounce, I think this is a stock having just made a breakout. I would not be surprised to see continuing movement to the upside. A pullback to about $84 would be beautiful because you'd have that rising 20-day test, and then you would also be testing this um, more intermediate term price support level right at about 84 as well. The last one I have is PKI. This is Perkin Elmer. Um, it's been weak here over the last three months, but off of an uptrend, I see an inverse left shoulder, neckline, inverse head, right side of the neckline, which actually went slightly above this and is now starting to pull back. I think a move back down that 92 and a half, 93 area you could keep a fairly tight stop, maybe a close below the 50-day moving average. And if this breaks out above 97, that measurement right there would be about $14 up to about the 111 area. So I think the reward to risk on this one, if it pulls back close to that 20-day moving average, I think would be really strong. And Aaron, I know I wanted you to pull this up before we go into the summary here. I wanted you to maybe to take a look at that CNMD or any others that you, you know may have been looking at. But I, I, when I saw it, I was like, I bet this is one that Aaron probably will like. So, <laughs> like CMD? Let me check here. I have a chart up. Uh, I'll get you to share my screen. There we are. I do like it. You, you do tend to understand what I'm looking for in a chart, but it does match up, I think, with a lot of what uh, you're looking at. Uh, rising trend channel is what I ended up uh, annotating at this point. I was trying to tell if there was a wedge and you could kind of get a wedge if you used this top with that top but I just it looks more like a rising trend channel I it doesn't look weak uh, PMO turned up and gave us that buy signal and positive territory I mean it, it's a great looking chart and you know we got the breakout the day to get in was Thursday when it when it uh, broke out again and then came back down. Uh, I still think there's plenty of room for this one to go based on the fact that I do have the PMO has lots of room before it becomes overbought. So I think that supports the fact that you could still see more upside. Yeah, I, I cheated a little bit. I'll have to admit I cheated because before I went into this, uh, this segment, I did pull this stock up on your chart style. Um, so I knew what the PMO was doing. I also saw the on balance volume, which held up, even though we had consolidated and pulled back a little bit oh, absolutely. in April and May, the on balance volume continued staying pretty high and then broke out with price again. So I thought that was also interesting. Yeah, because there you can see in the thumbnail, especially, you know, it comes up, it pulls back. But what's happening with OBV bottoms, they just are rising straight up. So the volume pattern looked great. Yeah, so you've got Aaron who uh, likes the stock and on a relative basis stock showing some nice strength. It actually just broke to a 52-week high, relative high to the S&P 500. So, you know, if you're trying to outperform the S&P 500 and healthcare does lead throughout the summer, I think this is a nice looking stock, one that uh, you certainly could maybe take a look at as we head into earnings season. Absolutely. And I am just now getting some of these put in for the 10 and 10 but there is the symbols that we did go over well as far as the earning spotlight tom went over and let's see we're going to go into our 10 and 10 like i said i'm uh, busily adding them into the chart list i'm going to actually show you how i do that uh, because i don't think everybody realizes how easy it is so i've got my 10 and 10 chart list i just hit many and I'm just typing in with commas all of your requests. And I type fairly fast, so it won't take too long. Only a few more left here. But it's an easy way to add a bunch at one time. Uh, you know, and I do do that a lot, obviously, every day when I do the 10 and 10. But I also do it for um, plenty of other, you know, watch lists and that sort of thing. So let's look at it here on the RRG and kind of all over the place, uh, but a lot of green. We're looking at a lot of leading stocks right now. And as far as the requests go, technology is definitely the, the high interest sector. All right, uh, well, we will jump in on the first one, which is Amgen. Indeed. All right, Amgen, well, first of all, I have to say, and I'm going to go over and show you, before I even get into this, let's take a look at the seasonality. 
Um, and this goes for a lot of biotech. So if you're looking at biotechs, one thing you might want to do is just pull up that seasonality and see what's going on. Look at the last five years. July, it's been up every year, averaging 9%. This is Amgen, averaging going up 9% in July, 4.1% in June. So these two months over the last five years have produced some great results. But going back the last 20 years, look at Amgen averaging 8.7% in the month of July. It's almost like if you don't do anything else with your portfolio, at least make sure you own some Amgen during July. It's gone up uh, better than four out of five years uh, for in July and averaged going up 8.7%. So we know that history is on our side with the stock before I ever even pull up the uh, charts. And I do have it annotated. So let me go back over to that one. And so now we're seeing this relative or we're starting to see the absolute strength here in June. And remember that seasonality chart showed us June and July. Here it comes with June volume coming in. Look at the relative strength all starting to pick up as well. The biotechs are now at about a 10 week relative high to the S&P 500. We knew, well, we knew that that was the tendency. We didn't know it was coming, but we knew it was the tendency. And now I'm watching Amgen relative to the biotechs to see if we can move out to about a five, five and a half month relative high. Because if biotechs keep moving and Amgen breaks out on a relative basis and knowing what we know about their seasonal pattern, look at this, this downtrend line. This could be another confirming signal. I like Amgen. Now, I'd like to maybe get a little bit of confirmation here. And perhaps, you know, re the risk would be reduced if we had a little bit of profit taking for a couple days and maybe get in on that. But Amgen is one I certainly would keep on a watch list. I like it. All right. Let's see. What is the most popular in the chat room? And that would be, wow, there's a tie. So let's start with Roku. Yeah, Roku is a stock I own and I like. We are getting a 20-day test for the first time since its earnings came out back in May. So that's probably a little bit of a positive. Got all the way down to 98.68, bouncing off of it. The stock was up to about 107 or 108 at its high. Another one of the stocks, and I've been, you know, this has been the theme the last couple of days. It seems like Thursday was a high for many of these stocks that have been performing really well. And as money rotates into some other areas, money's been rotating out of these stocks. I still believe on a relative basis, this is one of the best stocks in the market. It's doing a lot of this without the computer hardware group really doing well. But a lot of that is based on Apple. I mean, if we were to strip Apple out, there are some companies within computer hardware doing well. And Roku is certainly one of those. So I like the stock and I actually do like it here on this 20 day test. So I would annotate. Now, if it loses the 20 day, you might want to be careful because I, I don't have the PPO up here, but I do think there's a negative divergence in play. So if it fails to hold the 20, that could lead to a 50 day test. Um, you might, and it is a volatile stock, as you can see throughout this chart. So uh, I would be paying attention if the 20 day is lost. Okay. The next one that was also popular was uh, BLD, an industrial top build. And one of the comments on it was, is this Tom's perfect entry? Well, I'll tell you what, it's a pretty darn good one. Um, I do like this. And this is another one that on a relative basis to its peers has been pulling back while it consolidates. So I think this is a really nice looking chart. Um, I prefer ascending triangles to descending triangles. And I think we have a descending triangle here where you've got the equal lows coming across and you've got the lower highs. But it doesn't really, I, it wouldn't bother me unless we lost gap support, to be honest, which all, is all the way down 74. Now, this was a stock that was up to 87. So I think anything in the mid 70s, I think today's low, for instance, 77, all the way down to the 74 level, I, that to me would be a perfect accumulation zone. Um, so, yes, I do agree that I think that the recent selling has been an opportunity here to get in. Beautiful move to the upside, sideways consolidation. I think if you break that trend line to the downside, that would be a very bullish confirmation here. Okay. Let's see. Next one is our only financial, and that would be Chubb CB. All right. CB, um, nice move. Um, you can see that uh, within the insurance group, that group's been strong on a relative basis. The group's been strong, although we're getting a little bit of a pullback here in June. The stock has been pulling back as a result um, of the overall weakness in the group. Um, 
uh, relative weakness in the group, I should say. But I think that the chart overall here still looks very good, very constructive. I think that there are a couple of areas that maybe I would just watch to the downside. I'd continue to hold it. Um, I think the recent low, well, there was a, the prior top, and then we came down just below right about there. So I think 144, 145, giving this a little bit of room to the downside. Notice 50-day moving average comes right in there as well. And in 2019, really since the first week of 2019, we have not closed below the 50-day moving average. So I think 144 to 145 is the area I'd watch the downside. Otherwise, I'd hold. All right. Let's see. Let's look at uh, Equitrans midstream, and that would be ETRN. Okay, just a lot of sideways consolidation since going public here back in early November. Um, the overall group's kind of been sideways, so on a relative basis, it's sideways. The only thing is that the overall group um, is lower versus the S&P 500. So, um, yeah, and, I mean, you're in that oil space, so I, I would personally pass on it. I think there are other areas right now that I'd be much more focused in. If the dollar were to have a major breakdown, and I think we'd probably have to be looking at the dollar index falling to about 93 below that level before I would start getting concerned, then I think that would open up the door for energy and materials to outperform um, further out. But I think short term, we're getting a little bit of a pop, um, nice volume coming in, increase in volume, which is nice. But we've seen this before. You can go back to March and see the same thing, and it just didn't last. A breakout ultimately above about 22.25, close above 22.25 might get me a little bit more interested in the stock. Um, but I just think the group itself would probably keep me out of it. And in the meantime, maybe just watch the support around 19 and a quarter and the resistance just above 22. All right. Let's see. Next one is going to be PBF. All right. And that is exploration and production. Yeah, the relative strength just would completely keep me out of this. It, you know, I'm a, a big relative strength fan, as you should know if you've been watching the show. And so if I get a, a, a group like this, I mean, yes, we had a nice pop and that gets you excited. But we've had nice pops before. And when you're in a long term relative downtrend and an absolute downtrend, these chasing these short term moves to the upside tend to be very, um, well, not very good uh, for your portfolio. So I just think there's too much still going on here. We've had very little action above the 50-day moving average for the last eight months. And when we have, we couldn't negotiate the prior high. I just think we're in a downtrend and a, and a relative downtrend. So I would say until the downtrend breaks, and for me, that would be watching not only this downtrend, which is the absolute, but I'm also talking about these relative downtrends. Um, here is uh, the overall group, but here's the stock relative to the group. And then here's the group relative to the S&P 500. That is a formula for financial disaster if you own a stock and it just keeps doing that. So I'd want to wait and see, start to see some relative strength in the stock and in the group, and then I'd be more interested. Okay, let's see. This one is a pharmaceutical company. M-E-I Pharma, and it is M-E-I-P. All right, M-E-I-P. Well, failing at the 20, and this is another one where the pharmas haven't been bad, rising in June, but look at the heavy volume selling in this stock. So I don't even have to tell you that it's the relative strength is very poor, volume trends are poor, failure at the 20-day moving average, and this is all coming in a market um, that has been pretty good. And you're in a space where the market's been pretty good. I think the overall healthcare group, I wrote my article, blog article this morning, that uh, healthcare over the last 30 days trails only materials in terms of strength. So you've got a group that's been really strong and, and you've been in a, an area within the healthcare space that's been pretty strong and you still can't go up. And not only do you not go up, you go down on big volume. I just not seeing it here. I don't know this company very well, so I'm going to assume that it's a pretty small pharma and it probably is dependent on one drug and it could go one way or the other. So these types of stocks I tend to avoid anyway, but the relative strength tells me to stay away for now. All right. 
Um, this one looks interesting. It is the Regional Banking ETF KRE. It's been in a tr trading zone. I mean, a, not much going on here. Yeah, the 10 year Treasury yield moving lower is just not helping you know, this area of the market. So let me pull this up on a one year chart. And actually, I'm going to pull it up even longer. Let's go back five years. I'm going to do a line chart. And also, instead of the RSI, I'll put in here the KRE relative to the S&P 500. So you can kind of get a sense of what's going on. I just I'm not a fan of an area of the market that is not seeing money coming in. It's rotating lower. And this is a perfect example here. So this is a five year chart. And if you look at the trend lines here. You've got the absolute chart clearly moving lower. I think if we could maybe get up and break out above that double top, right about there, close to 57, then maybe we'd have something going. Until then, I'd be a little careful. Um, but then look at the relative, you know, KRE relative to the S&P 500. You've got a couple of relative support levels you could watch, the low that was hit back in March, and then the multi-year low back in 2015 and 2016. So you've got some relative support maybe to hang your hat on, but I'd, I just want to see it start to show some outperformance first. So I'm going to pass here. Okay. Let's see, this one has been quite the performer. I don't think you'd need a relative chart to tell that. Thomas Reuters, T-R-I, T-R-I. Yeah, this, this has been a great performing stock. I will go ahead and pull it up on the relative strength chart, but yeah, you're right, Aaron. In the publishing group, you can see the group is broken out. This stock has been one of the best stocks within that group and really very little in the way of pullbacks. So, uh, you know, if I had to maybe check off maybe a line in the sand support area to the downside, maybe it would be these two levels. Here you've got um, the breakout um, from this sideways consolidation. And on that breakout, you could see the volume spike here. And then the subsequent selling to establish support i just say 62, 63. As long as that holds, I'm fine holding TRI. It looks good. Okay. Let's see. Next one. And the last one will be RNG. Yeah, I think I looked at this one earlier in, what did I look at it in? Maybe my setups. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but I like the hammer. So I would just, this has been a pretty good relative performer. It has been consolidating. So it's lost a little bit of its relative luster because of that. But here was your breakout back at the end of April. And notice where we've come down to, basically holding these areas. And then also, I think you could draw a line here where we closed to open June. So this one, let's just say 112 to 113 area, pretty important. I do like this hammer. I think we got a really good shot to go back up and test that you know, 125, 126 area. So I'm a fan. I like RNG. All right. And that is the 10 and 10. Here are the symbols that we just went over. And I will have these up in the Market Watchers Live chart list very quickly. You just go to the articles tab, go to the Market Watchers Live blog, and the link to that live chart list is right there at the top. Okay, we, we, will, we will be back uh, in a moment. I'll have the sentiment update for you at the end of the show. The point of on trend is to keep you on the right side of the trend. Mostly dealing with stocks and ETFs, I'm going to point out bullish setups on stocks and ETFs that are in uptrend. I'm also going to look at some downtrends, but those are designed also to tell you which stocks and ETFs to stay away from. The main point is to stay on the right side of the trend, the uptrend. All right, ready for our final market update. And as you can see, markets are sitting kind of back on their heels. They are up. The uh, Dow Jones is up um, over 41 points right now, so not too terrible, up about 0.16%. NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange, the NYSE, are both in negative territory currently. But as we look right here, we've got the NASDAQ, and it is negative, but really moving sideways. Um, Friday, we 
started this sideways movement and we just haven't quit that. S&P 400 and Russell 2000, you can see the decline that we have been in. They have been underperformers and they obviously are continuing on that track. Uh, TSX, Canadian markets are mostly unchanged. Treasury yields are lower right now, 2.021%. VIX is well, really about the same, currently reading at 15 39. UUP moving sideways, but slightly lower, 0.1%. Gold continuing its upward, <laughs> it's, it's starlight run here. Uh, it is up, uh, GLD is up over 1% to 133.51. USO is down a little over three quarters of a percent currently at 11.88. And TLT uh, with yields a bit lower here, we've got TLT making the gap up and now traveling sideways currently at 132.41. Let us go and look at our sector summary and which ones are leading right now. You can see materials and consumer staples uh, are the leaders up uh, over half a percent for materials and just under a half a percent for consumer staples. Uh, the laggard and has been for a very long time is the energy sector today, especially down over three quarters of a percent. All right. I am going to show you the relative strength of the toys index. I spoke about toys earlier and we talked about the absolute chart and how we're trying to get this breakout here. This is a uh, a line chart, so it doesn't show intraday action, but we are on the verge of breaking out on a, an absolute basis. And I just wanted to show you on a relative basis how we have been underneath this 20-day moving average on a relative basis now for about three quarters, uh, nine months or so. If we can get back up above that 20, uh, this, this group has a history of being an underperforming group. And then when it gets through the 20, it takes off on a relative basis to the S&P 500. We saw it here for several months. We saw it here for about two months. We saw it here for another three or four months. So if we do break out after being, or, you know, after underperforming for so long, I actually think this is a group that could run for a little bit. Now, it, I think it's a little more aggressive to get in if it's just going through the 20 and the 20 is way below the 50 and we're below the center line. But the way I would guard against it is if it rolls back over beneath that 20 day moving average, then maybe call, you know, all bets off. But if we get through that 20 and we can hold it, I think toys is a group that could on a relative basis provide some really nice winners as we go forward. So I think the toys group is one to watch as we move forward. Okay, Aaron, I know it's uh, sentiment time and I'm interested to see with a lot of the folks moving a little bit more defensively at the end of last week. And even today, earlier when I was looking, uh, I think consumer staples was leading today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested to see whether the sentiment has changed with us hitting that 52 week or excuse me, our all time high really on the S&P 500 last week. What do you got? All right. Well, it is a, an interesting week. Of course, I find all weeks for sentiment interesting. Uh, today is our June 24th, 2019 decision point sentiment update. Uh, lots to show you. I will be looking at the put call ratio. I will be looking at the American Association of Individual Investors poll. Uh, you can go to aaii.org and take that poll. National Association of Active Investment Managers, or NAME as we call it, uh, we're going to look at their exposure to the market. Right X ratio is a decision point uh, indicator that we came up with. So I'll be showing you what's going on with the right X ratio and money flow. Wall Street Sentiment Survey, uh, very interesting this week, I would say. And then we have the VIX. I will look at that in terms of sentiment. And then I will cover some gold sentiment for you as well by looking at the discounts and premiums. All right. So let's go ahead. I'm going to go into the charts before we go ahead and summarize. And let's start off with the put call ratio chart. You know, what we look for it, for the bulls, if you're going to be bullish, is you look for bottoms and you look for the move to head upward. So I invert my scale because to me, higher numbers on the put call ratio means oversold, not overbought. So I'm looking at this as uh, we had two oversold readings. I think it's great that it didn't even have to go down uh, to the range that we were seeing previously on these lows. And it has kept 
moving up and it is moving up steadily. Uh, you'll notice that the OEX is moving lower. This is usually used as a hedge. So you will tend to see these uh, three travel a little bit differently from each other. Uh, so for me, this is saying bullish, bullish, bullish sentiment and um, hedging just in case, but we're gonna hedge a little bit more on the OEX. So when I look at this chart, uh, you know, we are getting overbought. We're not quite there. I think we still have room that we could go higher. Just looking at the typical top of the range here, we did get uh, some very high readings back here, but I think we have to be a little bit careful because we are getting into that overbought territory as far as um, the readings for these put call ratios. So. Currently, I would say they're still bullish because they're rising uh, fairly nicely, uh, but we are starting to see them get a little bit overbought here, and that would be bearish for the market. All right, AAII, as I said, you can go to their website. This is simply a poll of their um, not just subscribers, but just the public in general. So it's always interesting to see um, what everybody's thinking as far as the market goes. And what I found interesting on this chart, first of all, I'm gonna point out the ratio because the ratio is almost near one. So the ratio itself isn't telling me a whole lot because it's telling me that we have almost an even amount of bulls and bears because if the ratio obviously is one, these two are equal. So they're almost equal. And so that, you know, right off the bat, I'm thinking kind of neutral as far as the polling. But then when I looked at the actual data, you can see the bears are pulling back. There's less bears than we saw a couple weeks ago. And we're starting to see an increase in the bulls. Now we're not in overbought or, or climactic reading territory as far as either of these readings. But what we can look at is the fact we're getting this increase in bullishness and a decrease in bearishness. And when people are feeling bullish, Bullish sentiment is contrarian. Uh, typically, everybody jumps on the bandwagon, as I say, and then the wheel falls off. So you start looking for those reversals uh, in the price based on what's going on with the sentiment in a reverse fashion. So people are very bullish. That's very bearish for the market. So at this point, I wouldn't go very bearish, um, but I would say that you know, seeing that increase with people being um, more bullish than before, I would look at that as, you know, starting to get a little bit, uh, as far as the market's concerned, a little bit more bearish. Name exposure, not much to talk about here. We ended up with very little change in their exposure. And when you look at uh, the reading itself, while it is elevated, uh, it's not particularly elevated. So I really would look at this chart as neutral. You have uh, you know, exposure almost at 75, but we've seen much, much higher readings. And that's what you really wanna see are the extremes. I mean, sentiment is you know, interesting uh, when it's neutral to bearish or bullish. It's interesting to, to pay attention to, but really sentiment, I don't think calls it out for you unless you get those really climactic readings. And I think this chart is an example. These are not climactic readings, but we are seeing some, you know, a pretty good amount of exposure when you consider that we've seen readings down by 30 and in, in these two cases, you know, below 20 and this one, uh, just about, uh, it looks like just above 10. So, you know, this is not what I would call a, a perfectly low reading. Certainly it is in comparison to what we saw previously uh, back at the end of 2017 and, you know, these bottoms that we saw uh, back here during that correction. All right. <clears throat> excuse me, next one up is Wall Street Sentiment Survey. And I'm going to refer you back very quickly to that AAII chart we just looked at. Notice what's going on here. Increase in bulls and in decrease in bears. Okay, this is, these are the, you know, Johnny investor out there like me and you. Uh, the Wall Street Sentiment Survey, uh, I'm also a part of. So, this is the market timers and what they're thinking. And notice it's exactly the opposite. Market timers are pulling back as far as bullishness, but they're increasing on their bearishness. The ratio you can see is a bit lower, whereas on the AAII chart, 
we were looking at readings that were um, almost equal. So we had a, a reading almost at one. Uh, we're starting to see a, a difference here and a 0.75 ranking of course means there are um, more bears than bulls going on here. And 47%, we're looking at almost half of the market timers coming in uh, on the bearish side. And uh, I do believe I did as well. I figured, honestly, this week I was looking for a lot of sideways movement. I probably could have gone in neutral, um, but I, I looked at my charts and I was like, eh, I think this week we're going to look at a pullback. So what do I do with these two readings, right? We have the AAII and we're seeing the exact opposite of what's going on with the Wall Street market timers. And to me, what that says, uh, I would, I, I really, and I'll be honest, I, I assume that, um, you know, the AAII, that, you know, finger in the wind pull for everybody, uh, I think it's a good public, you know, general look at what the sentiment is. And so with them increasing um, to get more um, bullish and the bearish readings are getting um, less, they're feeling more bullish and that should be bearish for the market. I think the market timers here are a little bit more um, savvy. And so a lot of times we will be right uh, and we're not on the opposite side of the sentiment per se. So I'm looking at uh, this chart in conjunction with the AAII chart. And the fact that market timers are going the completely opposite way of the general public on that particular survey, I think that the market timers are probably right on here. And so I would look at this chart, even though everybody's getting more bearish, I would still look at this as bearish for the market, mainly because I saw the AAII chart and um, and the two of them are almost completely opposite. And so I, I would have to tip the scales toward the market timers, but of course I'm very biased considering that I am in that pool of people who uh, who do um, take that Wall Street sentiment survey. All right, let's look at Rydex asset analysis here. Uh, as you can see, it's really similar to what was going on last week. We're having a decrease in the bear funds assets as well as money market fund assets, but an increase in the bearish funds. This is the um, inverted scale for the ratio of these, uh, where we basically take all of those um, bear and money market assets. We consider that, you know, all of it's pretty much in the bearish pool. And then we divide that by the bullish assets. So you end up with a bear bull ratio here. And so the as, if the bull assets start getting closer and closer to infinity and they get higher and higher and higher, that makes this number smaller and smaller and smaller. So to me, when people are getting more and more bullish, you're adding bullish assets. That means this number is going to continue to get smaller and sentiment is uh, is contrarian. So if people are very, very bullish and you're at the top of this um, range, then you should start looking for that price reversal to the downside. So that's why I invert this particular scale, because overbought would mean lots of people in the bull assets and less um, assets in the bear and money market uh, funds. So. We're sitting kind of in the middle as far as the ratio goes, but we have been rising toward over uh, bot territory, not quite there. And really you can see that we can get these um, assets in the bull funds much higher. So uh, I think this is a pretty interesting chart today uh, in that it's really confirming what it was saying last week. Ultra short term indicators, VIX is sitting, you know, we've had this, uh, again, I invert this, for sentiment reasons, the lower the VIX, the more bull bullish people are. And that's when I start looking for that reversal to the downside. So I want to have overbought in my head on the top. So what I'm looking at right now is the VIX has been hanging out just above its moving average, um, oscillating right in there. And that tells me there is internal strength in the market to the on the bullish side. But the fact that it's sitting near the middle um, of that range, I don't think the VIX is telling us anything right now. Um, the range is getting pinched and I find that it's not as useful when it's pinched. Uh, the readings for breadth, you know, we, we had a decrease in the new highs, but we're still looking at, you know, a 50 um, for new highs, which is still pretty high. Uh, you've got 
the readings for the AD, net AD and volume are, you know, they, they're high, but they're not climactic. So really, um, this is more of a neutral chart. All right, let me look at GLD just for the moment quickly. And I mainly because I wanted you to see the price bar of what's going on today. We're up over 1% um, again here on gold. Let's look at it as far as the gold index goes, because that's what I concentrate on. And you can see that as far as gold sentiment, we still have very high discounts going on here um, based on what uh, the holdings are and what people are paying for them. Uh, the best part, I think, of this chart, honestly, is that breakout above 1410 that we saw on Friday. Yes, we pulled back, but we pulled back to the middle of the range and above, even though it's only um, you know 0.1 uh, above, 10 cents above, we still ended up above 1400. I think that's very bullish. And the higher discounts, uh, we still want to see that. That gives you, um, that's considered um, bullish sentiment. And I mean, a bearish sentiment because you're getting a lot of discounts, less interest in gold. And typically when those are high, that's when you start looking for those reversals. Um, you know, they're not they do persist. We've seen it be persisting here, even with the sideways movement. So, you know, I mean, when I look at it, I think there's there's nothing here telling me that gold's going to, you know, fail at this point, um, except for the fact we've got a PMO that is getting very overbought. We've seen higher readings, though, back here in September, you know, off of that really great rally. So not a surprise to see it where it is. Um, but we just need to be conscious of a possible pullback. I don't see it coming just yet, though. So I think we're still looking pretty good in the weekly chart. I think it'll show that. Look at that beautiful breakout from a trading range that we've been in, you know, since really 2014, 2013, um, that range. And we've now uh, managed to get higher than that. I'd start watching this top back here at about 1440. It'll be interesting to see if it can get above that. But man, I see that uh, breakout. I can't help but think good things for gold. All right, so that is it, but let's look at our tallies right now. Uh, 10 day moving average put call, bullish for the market, AAII. These will all be in the Market Watchers Live recap, so I really don't wanna read them back to you, um, but I did do something special I'll show you at the end here. There's our right X ratio, bullish money flow for sure, which is bearish for the market. Um, nothing for breadth and VIX. And again, bullish, I'm still looking bullish um, for gold with that discounts running pretty high. But let's look at the tally and see what it means for the market. So we had the put call ratios coming in bullish for the market, somewhat bearish. Look at all these neutrals and then two more bearishes. So I have to say neutral to bearish would be the call as far as sentiment is uh, concerned this week for the market. That's all I have for sentiment. Let's bring it back home now, Tom. All right. Well, I know that there was a question um, in the room that was asking about explaining my dollar article um, with the correlation with German yields. And this kind of ties in a little bit to gold as well, which you just talked about. Mm -hmm. And so I thought maybe I would just spend a, a minute since we have a little extra time today and just go through, um, you know, what I was uh, referring to. Excellent. Um, but yeah, here, the question that came in was basically, okay, can you explain um, your dollar article with the correlation with German yields? So here is the, the article, and here was the chart that I had showing the 10-year Treasury yield minus the German 10-year Treasury yield. And what you have to realize is that when our economy is expected to strengthen, normally we're going to see the yields rising. So when our yields are rising faster than Germany's, it's telling us that the market is anticipating that our economy is stronger than Germany's. And if that's the case, then what we should do is see our dollar index rising because a stronger economy, it used to be back in economics 101. I remember when I first started, started studying economics before we really got into a lot of global trade, it would be like, okay, if the US interest rates go up, then the dollar goes up. And if the interest rates go down, the dollar goes down. But I know John Murphy's written a lot about this, the, the correlation and, you know, looking at different markets, U.S. versus foreign markets, because we are a global economy. It's not so much what's going on in the U.S. It's what's going on in the U.S. versus what's going on everywhere else. 
And so I, that's why I think it's really important. Now, why do I pick Germany? Because I think that there is the strongest correlations between the U.S. and Germany. Um, I, you know, a lot of people talk about China. I think China and the U.S., the correlations are all over the place. Um, that's why I don't get too concerned if China's market's getting hit, because the correlation to the U.S. market really isn't that great. But it is between Germany and the U.S. So that's why I picked those two countries. Now, if you look at this, it's not a perfect correlation, but I think you can see that the trend in Treasury yields versus German Treasury yields is higher. The trend in the dollar is higher. And most of the correlation between the direction of the U.S. Treasury yield versus Germany, that correlation with the dollar tends to be very positive. And I think this chart bears me out. But we do go through periods where we see a little bit of inverse correlation. They don't go together. Here, we had the U.S. Treasury yields moving higher all the way up until, I would say, the fourth quarter of last year. The dollar overall was kind of rising with it. But since then, the past six months, seven months, this ratio has been going down in the yields, but the dollar has continued to set new highs. And that's resulted in this inverse correlation. So short term, I think the dollar could weaken further. I wouldn't be surprised. And if you look at the UUP on a daily chart, there's a negative divergence. So it definitely looks like we could weaken. If we weaken, I think that helps the gold case in the near term because there is an inverse correlation between dollar and gold. But I believe the long-term trend in the dollar is higher. I believe that the long-term trend in U.S. rates versus Germany is higher. So I think short-term gold could be a decent play. My biggest question is, do we outperform the S&P 500? Because so far in June, gold's having a great month. But guess what? The S&P 500 has been having a better month. So even though gold looks great on the chart, it's still not outperforming the S&P 500, and that's where I have a problem. Okay, um, I know we do have a poll um, for today, so why don't we, and I don't know if you have any further comments, but let's go over the poll first, Aaron, and then maybe sure. we can get back into this discussion. Sure. All right. All right, hmm. so that doesn't surprise me. CDNS has been one of the leaders, really high scooter stock. Um, I'm not shocked that uh, folks are interested. This has been a great performer for a while. Um, I actually liked your SRPT a little bit because it is in that biotech space that's and it's starting to show some relative leadership. Um, you know, something like that, I'd make sure my stops are in play, but I think SRPT is one that could make a, a pretty big run. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I, yeah, I still like Graco, um, you know, GGG, CDNS. Was that uh, one of ours or the producer picks? That was my pick for this week, Cadence oh. Design. It's a software oh. company. Well, perfect. Um, I guess that works out. Well, we'll see how we do next week. Uh, I'm going to share my screen real quickly because that was, uh, we did see a um, question, at least I saw a question about uh, one, uh, about room to run and what that means, uh, explaining how that happens. So I'm just going to really seriously quickly, PMO is not overbought. It can still rise. We got the breakout. There's room for it to run. It can move up to 54 without seeing a PMO that is overbought. And so that's what I mean when I say room to run. Yeah. I mean, when a stock is first making a, a, a move and you're starting to see relative strength and you got the scooter score rising, I mean, all of those things can be the start of a major run to the upside. Doesn't mean, doesn't guarantee it, but certainly you can't have a big run to the upside without a, a, a stock beginning to look like this. So I do agree. I think anytime you have the uh, momentum oscillators abo above zero, that's a pretty good sign. And you want it to stay above there, by the way. Right. And I just don't want to see, I don't want to get in if it's already overbought. I, I want to see room, quote unquote, to run. Yes. All right. Uh, well, I want to thank everybody for being with us today. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit. It is located below the video player. We love to get your feedback here, what you think of Market Watchers Live. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Monday afternoon, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Happy trading. Thank you.